Testing. Testing. Yeah. Uh, has anybody ever seen a live birth? Yeah. What'd you think? It's kind of gross. <laughs> Painful, loud, fingernails in your arms, uh, but ultimately beautiful, right? Seeing a new uh, human being <laughs> emerge into creation, like right there, that's a pretty phenomenal thing. Well, for those of you who have not ever witnessed a live birth, this morning you get to witness two. God is going to give birth to twins this morning. And uh, in fact, if you count the, the baptisms from the early service, God gave birth to quadruplets this morning, same morning. Uh, but that's what baptism is. It's a, it's a live birth. It's a new birth. I mean, the Bible describes baptism as someone dying to their old ways and, and their old patterns of behavior and, and where they were going before, and now they're coming up. They're being rebirthed into eternity. And it's even more exciting than, you know, that hospital room scene because these people will live forever in joy and peace in the presence of Christ and, and his family. And we get to watch that happen this morning. That's pretty cool, right? So we've got two people that we want to introduce you to as we celebrate their bas- baptisms together. Uh, and I first want to introduce you to Mr. Trevor Spignolis. Trevor, how you doing? Welcome to the stage. I'm going to stand over here. Your dad's having a hard time getting up here. Oh, you don't have to. Do you want him up here? Okay, sure. Uh, Trevor came to me a couple months ago and, and said, I think it was during VBS, right? He said, yeah, I, wanna, I think I want to get baptized. And I said, well, why don't you schedule an appointment with the pastor? And so we sat down in the office, and his mom brought him in, and I kept asking Trevor questions about Christianity and the gospel. And the funniest thing happened. His mom kept answering for him. And, uh, and, and I said, uh, you know, I kept asking uh, Trevor the questions, and, uh, and, and, he, and, you know, Summer would kind of pop in, and, and uh, finally Trevor said, Mom, I'm, 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 this is my baptism, and, and, uh, and Summer said, well, I just want to make sure you're, you're not nervous, and, uh, and Trevor said, I'm, I'm not nervous, <laughs> and I said, I wonder who's nervous. <laughs> But we got through it. We got through it. And uh, I asked him to write down the reasons that he wants to get baptized. And in, in wonderful fashion, he wrote down three points. <laughs> you want me to read them? Okay. I want all of my sins to be washed away so I can go to heaven. Um, that's not an awe thing. That's an awesome thing, all right? Aw, how sweet. He wants all his sins to be washed away. <laughs> that's a praise God thing, Okay. It is what God wants us to do. That's obedience. Yeah, that's an amen thing. Okay. And three, I want to follow Jesus and be like him. There it is. Three points. You can summarize everything in three points. All right, so we're going to pray for Trevor, and then we're going to um, go baptize him. Jeremy's going to be back there to baptize him. Let's pray. God, I thank you for Trevor and the way he... Uh, came into my office and sat there and, and dialogued uh, with me about his faith and about his Lord and uh, talked about sin and the resurrection. Uh, he had thought about these things and uh, he wants to believe them and he wants to declare them in front of a large group of people uh, so that we can support him and pray for him and encourage him. I thank you for his parents who have been so diligent in raising him and his brother uh, to be good people. But if being good people were enough, you know, heaven would be a lot more populated. You, you asked us to be saved through baptism and faith and obedience. So we pray for Trevor that you give him uh, the strength he needs to continue this journey all the way into heaven. Wash his sins away. Take away his guilt, his shame. Let him, over the course of his life, go back to this moment uh, as the moment of his rebirth, as a new creature in Jesus Christ. Pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, I'm back.
Trevor Spinolis, based on your profession of faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now I want to introduce you to Mr. Andrew Van Brunt. Where is Andrew? All right, right in front of me. There he is. Andrew's got quite a story, so here it is. Well, as Matt said, I'm Andrew. I've been coming to Rooftop for about a year and a half now. Uh, I want to begin to claim my inheritance today, uh, just as we talked about in Joshua, the Israelites uh, claiming their inheritance by taking over Canaan. Uh, I believe a faithful step in that direction is to be baptized today. I was raised in Presbyterian Church. <laughs> <laughs> this is too good of a story for anybody to not hear because of too many inches from... This is really awkward, isn't it? Go ahead. <laughs> I was raised in a Presbyterian church where my family would get up and, just like everyone else, put on our smiles and pretend to have perfect lives for an hour a week. When I was around 13 years old, my parents gave me the choice to continue or not, and I stopped going. Although I recited a statement of faith to the congregation, I don't even remember what I said, much less have any idea of what it meant. I was... I was completely clueless as what it meant to be a Christian. I thought they were those annoying guys that came by my house painfully early on Saturday mornings, handing out little pocket Bibles and pressuring me to go to their church. My impression of God was formed from listening to my parents discuss their Sunday school class on the way home from church. I concluded from their discussions that God was this historical figure that did a lot of interesting stuff in ancient history but really wasn't relevant today, except to maybe a few overly zealous Bible thumpers and media sensation crazies like Harold Camping and other self-proclaimed doomsday prophets. Uh, I know now that it's, it's not Christians that are crazy. Uh, obviously, it's runners. Uh, I can say that because I am one. Probably the main reason I stopped attending church is that in junior high, I was struck with an anxiety and panic disorder, which resulted in having horrible panic attacks nearly every class period, and Sunday school was no exception. I suppose I did a pretty good job of keeping it hidden, especially from adults, but on the inside, even more fear and anxiety were being fueled by a perception that my peers could see right through my facade of being in control. In college, I got treatment for my disorder and became 99% panic-free. After graduating college, I married my first girlfriend, whom I had met my freshman year. Shortly after we married, I sunk into a deep depression. I felt helpless and stuck, not knowing what I wanted to do with my life. I thought I had everything planned out, but discovered that my plan to simply live happily ever after was lacking in details. I'd been so focused on finding a relationship, getting married, and pursuing academic success that I thought once all that happened for me, I could just relax, and the, that happily ever after would just fall into place without any additional effort. This wasn't the case, and my depression worsened to the point that I accepted the fact that I would never have a fulfilling life, would always hate my job, and would feel unloved and empty. I had made being a married person my identity, and my marriage was an idol that I worshipped. Uh, then, without warning, I was robbed of that identity. My wife grew tired of my pity party and left me. For someone who was already depressed, talk about the perfect way to drive them down so far that only God could save them. I think it was all part of his plan to have me in such a place where I wouldn't resist his speaking into my life. I stumbled upon a support group that was held in a church and was based on biblical truths and God's love. I was a little bit leery of, of it because of how I know that in my heart I had judged divorce and struggling people, and I expected to be judged as well. Harking back to my childhood experiences of church, I also expected to be among people with the so-called perfect lives. What I found there was not judgment, but instead, understanding, compassion, solidarity, and a gentle steering towards Christ. The very demographic I had looked down upon and considered myself superior to were now supporting me and loving me despite my prior attitudes. God revealed to me that this was a microcosm of his love, uh, utterly undeserved yet freely given. After a while, my depression faded, and I found myself feeling uh, happier than I had had ever remembered by simply knowing that God, God loves and forgives me despite my years of indifference towards him. 
I had a glimpse into what it was like to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and the strength only he can give, and I wanted more of that. There is no doubt in my mind that it is God who has made me into a new person. He promises to all of his people in Ezekiel 36, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your impurities and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I couldn't have felt this promise of new life any more strongly than I do now. I found a home here at Rooftop with friendly and very real people, not afraid to admit their struggles and mistakes. I want to express my sincere gratitude to you for hosting me in your homes for supper clubs and small groups and for allowing me to play with Play-Doh, I mean assist in the preschool room. Uh, I hope to continue to serve and be involved here in my church home. Thank you for listening and thank you for being my church family. Let's pray for Andrew. God, I thank you for the way that you have slowly and patiently been walking with Andrew since he was born in that hospital room and even before then. And you have suffered along with him uh, through his anxiety and through his depression and through his career angst and through his divorce and through his recovery. And you are here now in this room celebrating, clapping louder and longer than we can imagine uh, for uh, the way Andrew has responded to your activity. I thank you for, in the midst of all that he's suffered, uh, speaking to him and, and saying to him through a support group and through a loving church family that he is loved, uh, not necessarily because he is worthy of love, but because you created him and you love your creation. I pray that you stay with him on this journey. I know that you will, but I ask for it. I pray that he continues to respond to your goodness and your grace and your guidance and your direction. I pray that you bless him with the power of your spirit so that he can keep growing and serving and loving uh, as Jesus uh, desires him to. Thank you for the honor of being here in the hospital room with him this morning as we watch uh, his rebirth. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Andrew Van Brunt, based on your testimony and your proclamation of faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> 